Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh wow. Well, uh, How are you feeling? Last Sunday after class, I got an airplane headed for Virginia Beach, and I got back late last night. So that's why I missed the Seder. Wow. Uh, I literally wow. spent between class time last week and today uh, on the East Coast. And yeah, uh, when I arrived, I was interviewed uh, for the 700 Club, and. Uh, you know, Pat Robertson's now 88 years of age. Wow. And he says he still puts in a full day's work every day. So, uh, and he says, you know, you, you got seven minutes, so make sure you get what you need to get in in that seven minutes. And, <laughs> so, Pat will interrupt you once in a while, but he'll try to get your sound bites in. Wound up with 15 minutes. Oh, so, so nice. it's really good. And uh, we talked about the crater and the cosmos. And uh, Pat actually remembered when I was on 25 years ago. We talked about the first edition. So and he said, you know, why do you keep bringing up these new editions? And I said, there's a biblical principle you see in Job and Psalms. The more you learn about nature, the more evidence you'll see for the supernatural and the work of God. Now, the four editions, this is the one that shows that more dramatically than any other edition. So, and thanks to Pat, he basically said, you know, what I appreciate about this book, it's a wonderful tool for Christians to give to their non-Christian friends. And uh, that went out and, uh, you know, it actually went to uh, number 38 on uh, Amazon's uh, best-selling list. So, yeah, incredible. So, uh, although I noticed a lot of people were buying the second edition and uh, the third edition, why? Because Amazon's business policy is they keep a minimum number of books. So it's still not available from Amazon, even though it's been, you know, between 38 and 100 all that uh, time. But uh, we did ship out, uh, I think it was 1,400 books to them. So hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll get it back. Well, it just says on the Amazon site, out of stock. So uh, they, will, they will fill it. What I noticed is people were buying the old editions because they couldn't get the new edition. And uh, they got the ebook has been doing for that too, because people can get that right away. So, uh, and then right afterwards, I did a couple more TV shows, uh, and then wound up uh, being interviewed for two documentaries. And the documentaries are actually uh, targeting uh, the Middle East. So they did interview me in English, but the host is someone who's fluent in Arabic, so she introduced the thing in Arabic. But the good news is uh, most Arabic speakers also know and understand English. So I said it's fine, especially with the science stuff. They said often they prefer that it be in English. Because the English is, incidentally, uh, English is becoming the science language of the world. It's really the only language that's got an adequate vocabulary to be able to communicate all these scientific complexities. You know, when I attend these uh, scientific conferences, I run into people who live in foreign countries and their English is actually better than their native tongue because they basically say, we speak English all the time, we write in English. And the most humorous thing is we were entertaining some astronomers uh, from the Paris Observatory. And I was amazed, I mean, they had American accents and everything. So <laughs> I said, yeah, but we struggle ordering something off of a, a, a restaurant in Paris. So <laughs> apparently they speak English so much that they, they really have lost a lot of their ability to speak their own native language. So, but uh, yeah, it's different from when I was in grad school. Uh, I had to learn two foreign languages to get my PhD because there were still a lot of journals that were publishing in foreign languages. And the discipline of astronomy, 100% of it's now in English. It's all English. So, which makes it easy as I travel around the world. I know people uh, who have advanced degrees are going to be fluent in English. And even those that are art, what I've learned is you bring two projectors. Projector number one is in English. Projector number two is in their native language. And it's interesting how people will prefer to read one or the other. So uh, that's something we do. But the primary reason I was there was to teach at the Regent University. So I gave seven lectures to the engineering and science students, uh, one lecture to the Bible students, and five lectures <coughs> to the divinity students. And the five lectures of the Divinity students were recorded uh, because basically Pat Robertson, as the Chancellor, said, uh, I want all those lectures required for every Divinity student that goes through Regent University. We're hoping also to be able to get them because uh, my basis is huge. It's got to be 30 minutes each, right at 30. 
uh, but sometimes it's really helpful to be able to take that material and condense it down uh, to 30 minutes. And I kept running into people who said, you know, I just, I want to know uh, who I should give this book to. So they're basically thinking about non-Christians they can give the book to. That's really encouraging. So that's why I wrote this book. So it would be a tool for Christians to give to their non-Christian friends. Yes? Do we have the copies here that yes. we can buy? Yes. They're right here. We haven't run out of copies. It's only Amazon has run out of copies. <laughs> so, as I said, it's Amazon's business model. They, they keep low inventories. Yes? Did you run across much of the Young Earth issues, or did you address that directly pretty much? I, there wasn't in any of my lectures, but uh, I did run into a lot of students <coughs> who come from that background. Uh, but what was interesting is those students basically wanted help. So this is how they've been raised. And they know it's not really effective to share with non-Christians. And they just simply wanted the assurance that my old earth perspective uh, wasn't conceding ground to the biological evolution, naturalistic biological evolution. And what really helped is just being able to explain to them, if you take a young earth position, you're actually forced to adopt Darwinian evolution to a degree more than 10,000 times more rapid and efficient than what any atheist would ever dare suggest. And a lot of them had no idea. I mean, this is so a very... So how much has changed in 30 years since I was in college? <laughs> well, From that well what I'm finding over the past 30 years, 30 years ago, people would think I was a tool of Satan, yeah. and uh, I was some kind of heretic, <laughs> and I was an evil guy, yeah, yeah. and I was mean-spirited. Uh, the fact that I've been in ministry for, you know, 35 right. years, People realize, you know, that's not my demeanor. I mean, that's kind of out there now. And also, I think I've learned that when you speak to younger creationists, you need to lead with the Bible. So I basically would explain to these students, I says, look at these texts. The laws of physics do not change. God actually establishes his immutability. You see it in Jeremiah 33. You change, I never change. It's proof that I never change. Look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they never change, I don't change. And basically it tells us in Romans, they will not change until God has completed his redemptive work in this universe. Then God will replace his universe with a brand new universe. And there you get different laws of physics. But the key there is every young earth creationist model critically depends on radically altered laws of physics at the fall of Adam, the flood, or both. And by radical, I mean by factors a billion times. And the Bible says they don't change. And I'm basically making the point, too, if you actually look at all 66 books of the Bible, not just the first book of the Bible, but all 66, read all 66 literally and consistently, you realize it's not possible to interpret the days as only 24-hour periods. They have to be six consecutive long periods of time. I found, too, with these students, it really helped to tell them, look, you don't have to know Hebrew. Just look at the first page of the Bible. You know this word day has at least three distinct little definitions, because three are used right there in the first page. I mean, creation day one, that contrasts days and nights. That's the word day for the daylight hours. Creation day four, seasons, days, and years. That's a day is 24 hours. Then in Genesis 2.4, it uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day as a long period of time. And uh, you won't see it in some of the more modern translations, but I found most younger creations really like King James. King James faithfully translates Genesis 2.4. It uses the word day. And it is the Hebrew word yom, translated day. So right there in the text you know one of the literal definitions is a long period of time. So, yeah. And which one of your writings do you, do you uh, uh, make the case that uh, that the uh, speed of, of uh, light? No, the speed, speed of, uh, of uh, uh, evolution. If, if you adopt, if you adopt uh, yeah, I have that in a chapter in a matter of days. 
uh, basically pointing out the incredible irony. Here's this group of Christianity who's very anti-evolution, and yet they are forced to invoke uh, a speed of evolution that's beyond what anyone has ever imagined. That speed of evolution is what I was trying to get out right. of my mouth. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I don't really understand that as well as I need to. Well, here it is in a nutshell. Um, the young earth model basically says nothing died until Adam sinned. So they're not, so basically they're looking at Romans 5.12. In fact, that came up when I was back there in the Virginia Beach. It says, look, the Bible says death came through Adam's sin. And it says, well, here's the problem. When young earth creationists quote that verse, they quote just that phrase. Let's actually read all of Romans 5.12. If you read all of Romans 5.12, it says, Death through sin, because of Adam's offense, was visited upon all people. And so you've got two qualifications. Death through sin, only one species of life experiences sin. And it says, death to all people, not death to all life. So it says, the fact that Paul qualifies it twice in one sentence is a clue that he's purposely excluding plant and animal death. And if you have any doubts, he repeats those exclusions in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. And so that really should relieve any possible doubt that. And when I've talked to younger theologians, they say, yeah, I agree. Nowhere in the Bible does it say uh, that Adam's offense brought about plant and animal death. It's only human death that was brought about. But I understood you to say that, that, uh, that Darwinian evolution... Okay, let me get to that, okay? Here's where it shows up in the young earth model. Okay, uh, if, if Adam's offense is the first time uh, that, say, animals die, uh, then that means that there's no carnivores before the flood, or before Adam. However, once Adam sins, you've got all these herbivores that must rapidly <coughs> evolve to become carnivores. And the real problem is when you get to animals like sharks, because the internal organs uh, are only able to deal, for example, the, uh, the liver of a shark is one-third of its body weight. That's because the shark is predominantly feeding on fat. And so it has this enormous, and that's true of all, like the polar bears have a really huge uh, liver. And the carnivores today are not able to survive on vegetable matter. For example, you can feed vegetable matter to a dog, it could concentrate the calories, but it's not going to work on a cat. A cat's digestive tract cannot handle a diet that's a pure uh, vegetable. Even if you concentrate the calories, the cat can't make it uh, because the digestive tract isn't designed. And, and like with a shark, uh, it not only, uh, for example, what you'll notice, say, with polar bears and sharks, is that when they kill a creature, they go for the fat and they leave the rest. They leave that for other carnivores. And uh, so, like with a seal, uh, they won't eat the meat, they eat the fat, they eat the skin, because that's where the calories are. And that's what their body is able to uh, consume. Which is why when you get bitten by a shark, the shark quickly figures out there's not enough fat in your body, <laughs> and it spits you out. But hey, you still bleed to death. Because you, <laughs> you can tell them that ahead of time. That's why I've been telling you know, people who manufacture these, because I have to wear a wetsuit when I go uh, surfing. Oh, yes. And they're black. Yeah. So yeah. you look kind of like a seal. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we make it bright red? <laughs> or green. Your fluorescent green would be good. That way you won't fool the shark. horizontal striped ones, right? Yeah. That's like the sea snake. Yeah. That, that it actually seems to have some efficacy. Yeah, so that, that could work. So. It looks kind of funny on the beach, but it's... Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I'm glad that God made us bipedal, tall, and skinny without a lot of fat, because that way these carnivores... I was once for sure that there's uh, an atheist, not an anti-theist, you know, there's a difference. But I've been talking to an atheist today that said she was talking to a theist or a Cre I don't know if it was a Christian, but that theist said, I don't believe in science. And she thought that was incredibly dumb for anybody to say that. And I, I said, 
with all the respect, I have to say I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we all benefit from science every day, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I think that goes back to this young creation thing. Well, that was so <laughs> encouraging about my teaching at Regent is that there, the whole faculty is really emphasizing God gave us two books. We need to teach both books, and we need to integrate the two books. That's why they had me there for the week. Have you ever been invited up to Liberty? Never been invited to Liberty. That would, that would be a good That probably will never happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a start, right? Well, uh, Liberty, uh, to teach there, you have to sign a statement that you believe that the universe is less than 10,000 years old. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, That's uh, why I said it. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to have a hard time persuading me to sign that statement. So. <laughs> So, but interestingly, I do get to talk to a lot of faculty and students from Liberty, and uh, you know they're aware that uh, there's a very uh, biblical older physician. Well, so. what's so cool about you now versus when I first heard about you 15 years ago is is people who even just get a glimpse of you on 700 or wherever at school can then go to YouTube. So that, I mean, there's there's just volumes of stuff out there for yeah. people who have the desire to actually seek out. Yeah, this is what's different. I mean, for example, all these students who came to me with their uh, young earth uh, perspective, They're on their phones. none of them were hostile. They just wanted to know. Uh, whereas 30 years ago, 20 years ago, a lot of hostility. But you're right, the fact that everything's up there on YouTube. Incidentally, if you're not aware of this, Reasons to Believe has a YouTube channel that we populate 24-7. But it's And hopefully monetize. No. No, we don't get a dime off of it. No, you got to work on that. Got to work on that. Well, because I watched one of yours the other day, and I was amazed. It had 900. It was approaching a million views. I forget which one it was exactly, but it was like 900,000 plus. So. Well, the ones that have the greatest number of views are the pirated ones. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably one reason why we're never going to be able to monetize it. Yeah. <laughs> most of the stuff up there has already been pirated. But you know, we kind of let that go because uh, it's reaching an audience. Right. Right. And you know, YouTube's effective in the sense that all these people who claim that I'm a really mean-spirited guy, they go to YouTube, they find that, gee, it doesn't look that way. And so I've met that sense, they tend to approach me with a lot less hostility than was the case uh, 20 and uh, 30 uh, years ago. But I'll tell you one thing that was funny is, uh, you know, they know my age. And so they were saying, well, Dr. Ross, it's a half mile walk to the next lecture. Are you okay walking? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I'll race you with my briefcase. How about that? <laughs> so. You know, I still have that tape of you, you being on Focus on the Family in, I think it was 1986 or something. Well, uh, that actually helped get reasons to believe off the ground. Uh, in fact, uh, I was interviewed by Jim Dobson in 1983, and uh, that was before we launched Reasons to Believe, but, uh, you know, they like to collect all the names, but what happened is they got 300 letters with really technical questions, <laughs> and so they said, we can't answer these questions. Uh, will you answer them? And I said, sure, but you know what? That gave us a 300-name mailing list. And that proved to be critical for launching Reasons to Believe. Reasons to Believe would have never gotten off the ground uh, without that mailing list of 300 names. And you helped focus on the family, too. We did help focus on the family. And focus on the family helped us again when the first edition of The Fingerprint of God came out. Uh, Jim Dobson uh, interviewed me, and uh, within a week, uh, there was 22,000 copies that sold. So, and uh, that, again, really helped. I can tell you, the first 10 years of reasons to believe, we weren't sure whether we were going to survive week to week. Uh, it just took a lot of little big things like that that, that kept us afloat. Yes? I, I'm, I'm missing something. What, what do the early Earthers believe about evolution? Well, and most younger say. creationists have no idea that they're... Uh, doctrine requires very aggressive evolution to survive. And it's not just the carnivore issue. You also got the problem with the flood. So they don't believe in, in evolution? Well, you know, when I talk to the leaders, and you actually look at what it is in print, I say, you know what, we're a little disturbed that you're pointing out that we believe in all this aggressive evolution. It says, look, I'm just citing the atheists. 
the atheists have written books where they're pointing that this is, they say, you know, isn't this ironic? These Christians actually believe in evolution to a far greater degree than we do. And I said, that's all I did. I, I just cited them. And they said, well, we refer to ourselves as diversificationists, not evolutionists. <laughs> and so we believe life diversifies and doesn't evolve. Well, I mean, it's the same thing. So. Well, then, then how does it work without believing that there is death? There, there has to be death for evolution to work. Well, what they're claiming is death didn't happen until Adam sinned. And that's when these uh, herbivores rapidly evolved, some of them, to become carnivores. So they're basically appealing to very aggressive evolution to explain how this population of animals that were all herbivores, where a whole bunch of them became carnivores. And then they have the problem with the flood because they believe that you know, all land life was wiped out by the flood of uh, Noah, and so they have to have millions of species evolving from the thousands that are on board Noah's Ark. And that happens again very quickly. And what they claim is that God endowed these uh, creatures with super genomes that were able to diversify very quickly. But if you actually look at the genetics of what they're proposing, it's simply not possible to have a creature with that kind of a genome actually be stable. Now, the creature would not be stable. So... Fuzz has written some articles on the problem with their, quote, diversification model. But the vast majority of younger creations have no idea uh, that this is a core belief of uh, you know, their, uh, their doctrinal system. I mean, the students I address have no idea. Oh, yeah, I guess that, that is a problem. And so. they used to claim you were an atheist. Uh, <laughs> right. Didn't they? Well, anybody that's old age in there, you know, many years. Yeah. Yeah, their whole thing is, if you're old Earth, you must be an evolutionist. And if you're old Earth, you have to be a compromiser. The label they put on me is that I'm a semi-creationist. But as speaking so. of someone who grew up in that culture, I would argue that most, quote, young Earth creationists haven't spent much time thinking about it. It's just parroting what they've heard from the pulpit. And they equate, you know, anything that's science-related is Darwinism, is evolution. What's also encouraging about the students I was engaging? It's like... This is how they're raised. This is all they heard. And it's like, you know, we're interested. I mean, what else is out there? I mean, they really had never heard about the framework hypothesis. Said, well, I'm not framework, but let me tell you what it is. I mean, it's a viable position within the Christian community. So they kind of felt cheated that they were not allowed to understand the full scope of different interpretations. So... Yes. Uh, Phil, uh, this is a good point to uh, segue to Isaiah. I get, okay. I get feedback. They love the science, and, but they also like the scripture when you have a balance of both. Okay. Well, I'll tell you one more story before I jump into Isaiah. And uh, it was, this is quick. No questions or comments on Okay. <laughs> and it was an atheist who basically said, look, to the Christian, I'll give you $1,000 if you can tell me exactly where God is. And the Christian's response was, I'll give you $2,000 if you can tell me where God is not. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, yeah, Isaiah. Okay. If you don't have the Isaiah uh, uh, questions, incidentally, uh, I was teaching there at, um, at Regent, and one of the uh, uh, theology professors is telling me, I just designed, I'm going to launch next week, a whole course on the book of Isaiah. It's going to be a semester-long course in the book of Isaiah. Uh -huh. He says, I heard uh, that you're teaching on the book of Isaiah, so I'm not doing what you're doing. I'm not going to be going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. All we're doing is looking at the creation and science parts of the book of Isaiah. And he says, well, I'll bet it'll take you just as long for you to finish as it takes me to finish. <laughs> And I says, I think that's a bit conservative. So. <laughs> uh, but hey, these are the study questions. We have the book of Isaiah. And yes, if you think we're going through the whole book, we're not. Uh, we're just picking up those pieces. But yeah, we're talking a little bit before class. Of all the books of the Old Testament, Isaiah is the one that's most forbidden for Jews to read. They're allowed to read parts of it. Uh, but that is kind of the forbidden part. Um, especially the text that we're going to be studying. In fact, uh, a friend of mine who heads up reasons to believe in South Africa, the astronomer uh, David Block, 
was raised an Orthodox Jew. And he says, I became a Christian through reading all the Old Testament passages my rabbis forbade me to read. And it was predominantly texts of the book of Isaiah. And as we're going to see, there's some reasons why Jews look at this as, quote, forbidden scripture. But here's the irony. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only Old Testament book that was there in its entirety was the book of Isaiah. And it's actually on display in downtown Jerusalem. And you can actually read the whole thing in Hebrew if you take enough time. Because they got the whole thing on display. Uh, but yeah, what I notice is Jews, I've been there, and the Jews will look at it and walk away. It's like, no, you need to actually read what's there. So, they spread it out. They, they get the whole thing spread out. Yeah, it's all unrolled. And if you took the time, you could actually read the whole thing. But I thought, isn't that I, a, an incredible irony that the most forbidden book of the Old Testament is the one that actually exists in its entirety in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's displayed in its entirety right there in downtown Jerusalem. Yes? Recently, we uh, had some um, work done to support our foundation, and the gentlemen that came were Israeli. And we were having long religious talks, and they were both in the army, and they said they are required to, wear, to read Isaiah, and that they believe, and a lot of people believe, that Jesus is the Messiah, but they don't publicly proclaim it because they would be disowned. But he's, they're actually required as part of their training to read Isaiah. So that was very refreshing to us to hear. <coughs> well, there, I've heard now that... Uh, Messianic uh, Christianity is growing exponentially in Israel today. More Jews are becoming Christian than Arabs are becoming Christian. And that was unheard of even just a few years ago. It was always the Arabs that were really open, but now uh, it's the Jews. So anyway, if you don't have these uh, questions, uh, anybody doesn't have them can take them. Uh, most of you do because we already distributed 300 copies of them and I don't think there's that many people here in the class but you didn't bring your copy uh, and we're still on question number one <laughs> yeah we're already blasting through this but you know we're doing it in a way to kind of demonstrate you know this is how you go through a, a, a subject matter in detail in the Bible so uh, what we've done there's a question, I'll just read it. What Isaiah passages address the beginning of the universe? What do these passages say about the universe? How can we use these Isaiah texts to persuade people that God exists and the Bible is the word of God and that God is indeed the creator of the universe? So one exercise we had you all do here, remember we broke up into little small groups and in 15 minutes we collected all the passages in the book of Isaiah that are relevant to question number one. And we got like 40 passages. Then we spent some time actually going through those passages and seeing which ones really are relevant to question number one. And we wound up with about 30 texts. And then what I did last time we were, I was here is we actually read through all 30 texts quickly just to kind of get a flow of what it's all saying. And that's kind of a good thing to do. When you collect the passages, then actually read through it quickly to get a general sense of what it's saying, then go back over it in some detail <coughs> and see what's going on in each text. That's what we're going to do uh, today. But this is a principle you can apply to any biblical subject. So for example, if you were with this class some 25 years ago, we did the same thing. We went through the entire Bible and picked up every passage that pertains to God predestining every word, thought, and action. And we came up with about 1,500 different scripture passages. Then we read through those 1,500 really quickly, to see a kind of general sense of what it's saying, and we went through it in detail one passage at a time. And just to bring balance, we also uh, spent some time looking at all the passages that talk about how God has endowed every human being with free will, with freedom to choose. Because that's kind of the big paradox. How do you resolve human free choice and divine <coughs> predestination? Same exercise. Read through the whole Bible quickly, collect all the passages, you know, wind up with about 2,000. We throw away about 500, but we figured pretty weren't relevant. We had about 1,500 left. Interestingly, we wound up with about the same number of passages that are on the free will side as are on the predestination side. And uh, then we went through those passages very quickly to see what they all had to say and went through it in depth. So we're basically using the same principle and going through these 10 questions here concerning the book of Isaiah. 
So we're beginning what I think is the easiest question, and that's namely, what do these Isaiah texts say about God creating the universe, the beginning of the universe? Then we're going to apply that to the other uh, nine questions uh, that you see here. Okay, Isaiah 6, 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, his glory fills the whole earth. Now, as we go through each of these texts, I want you to address two questions. What does the text say that's relevant to the universe and God, and then how do we apply it? So what does it say, and how do you apply it? And we're going to do that with each one of these passages. So we're going to start with this one. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, his glory fills the whole earth. What is it actually saying about God, creation, and the universe? What he's saying is, no matter where you look geographically or philosophically, you're going to see evidence of his handiwork. You're going to see his handiwork? And what does his handiwork reveal? His glory. His glory. <laughs> Got it. No, that, that's a very good point. Basically telling us, no matter where you look, in all the earth, all the universe, uh, looking at uh, cockroaches, looking at dirt, uh, looking at uh, viruses, no matter where you look, you're going to see the glory of God. I'm not so sure about that cockroach thing, but okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a challenge that this passage gives us. I'm kidding. Okay, there's lots of things we see in this universe of ours and all of its life that doesn't seem very pleasant. Basically, this text is challenging. This is application now. Okay, we're getting at the application part. Yeah. If this passage is really saying what it says it says, it means we should be able to discover God's glory revealed literally in everything. Yeah, you've had blocks that mosquitoes are important. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can see the glory of God in mosquitoes when you get bit a few times. So. Yeah, well, it's no, all it's part serious. You have a about it. Oh, yeah. Somebody did. Well, uh, my colleague, uh, Anne Jeanette Roberts, uh, she wrote a really nice piece on mosquitoes, basically telling us, number one, there's nearly 300 different species of mosquitoes, and only six of them bite us. So just get mad at the six. <laughs> only the females. And only the females bite you. And they only bite you when they need to reproduce. So it's not as bad as what you think. Okay? Uh, how many of you enjoy fishing? Oh, yeah. Okay, what do you think the fish, those trout, eat? Yeah, they eat the lar a larvae of mosquitoes and they eat mosquitoes. So fishermen love mosquitoes because that's what keeps the, the trout nice and healthy and makes it uh, productive for us when we go fishing. So, hey, you can always wear one of those little net type things. But, <laughs> so, and then the other part is we human beings sent those species of six mosquitoes to places that God never intended them to be. Uh, if you go back before humanity, those six species existed in less than 10% of the land masses of the earth. Guess how much bigger percent they live on right now? Not quite 100, but it is 99. There's still places in the world you can go where there are no biting mosquitoes. But we're talking 1% of I'm the land aware. masses. And so when it says cursed is the ground because of you in Genesis 3.17, part of that curse is we spread these nasty mosquitoes that bite us to parts of the world that God never intended them to exist. So, but there are still places you can go. Yeah, you know, my wife is telling me, Q, I want to go on a vacation where there are no mosquitoes uh, that bite. And I said, well, there's a couple of places we can go. So, but there's other places where he said, Oh, no mosquitoes, but there's horse flies. So. <laughs> it's funny that I came here all the way up here to see you because there's one thing I wanted to bring up to you that everything is being managed for God's glory. Every right. single thing. That's actually a fulfillment of a promise in the book of Numbers. Yes. Even, though, even the astronomers, the astrophysicists, and the physicists cannot stop themselves from being used by God for his glory. Even the ones that don't believe in him, because they're the ones that brought that, that brought forth the anthropic principle and showed the divine design of the universe. They don't even know it, and they're being managed by God for his own glory. Well, you know, uh, when I was at Caltech, my specialty was quasars and galaxies. 
and I'd run into all these atheist astronomers there at Caltech, and they'd be writing papers about what they called grand design galaxies. The very fact that they called them wow. grand design <laughs> galaxies, that tells you something, right? <laughs> And we happen to live in the galaxy that's got the grandest design of all. Wow. So, but I think that's one thing that strikes uh, my peers is when you look at these nebulae and galaxies, you're struck by the beauty of it all. And you know, why are they so beautiful? And why do we appreciate the beauty? I mean, there's something that God designed within us that makes us really uh, relish the beauty of what we see. Uh, why are equations of mathematics and physics so beautiful and elegant? I remember I was taking an advanced math class as an undergraduate, and the professor said, one thing I want to share with all of you in this first lecture, nothing is more beautiful than the equations you're going to see in this class. <laughs> nothing. He says, I know we're on a campus with beaches all the way around it, beautiful forests, there's a golf course here. Uh, forget about all that. <laughs> it pales in comparison to the beauty of what I'm going to be showing you uh, in this uh, next semester. And you know, when I was done with the class, I, I kind of believed them. I said, these equations are really very elegant and beautiful, uh, magnificent. Or you know, when you study Maxwell's equations, four little equations, but look what they describe. It's just incredible. So I'm a little off track, but this is the whole point. The fa this passage really is saying every part of God's creation reveals God's glory. The application there is look for it, OK? If you see something that looks ugly, look for God's glory. If you see something that looks out of place, look for God's glory. There's nothing out of place. Everything is serving a purpose. That applies to the whole universe. That applies to everything here. It applies to all the parasites. Now, I frequently run into atheists who say, look, if there's a good God out there that's all powerful and all loving, there wouldn't be any parasites. God's glory is revealed in the parasites. And you'll see some articles I've written on a reasons.org website, the beauty and elegance of parasites and how we need those parasites. Given the laws of physics that God chose, they fulfill a critical role. There wouldn't be any balance of life if there weren't parasites. One of the more dramatic examples of that is the gypsy law. Uh, you know, I talked about how we imported mosquitoes and put them in places where God never intended. We did that with the gypsy moths. The gypsy moth uh, was indigenous uh, to Western Europe. And what happened is uh, there was a guy at Harvard, uh, an insect expert, and uh, he decided, hey, I want to study these gypsy moths. So he brought some gypsy moths over from Europe, had them in his little lab, and he's doing research on them. A couple of them escaped. Okay? Those two escaped and they multiplied. <laughs> and it was during the 19th century, it was so bad that they would get these gypsy moths uh, epidemics where they would literally strip every leaf off of every deciduous tree. <coughs> and when they stripped all those leaves off, the whole ecosystem would collapse. And eventually, the gypsy moths had nothing to eat. They would all die, and then everything would come back. But it was like a 10-year cycle. Every 10 years, you would get this complete collapse of the eastern U.S. Uh, ecosystem. And so they said, what are we going to do? Well, uh, again, it was Harvard uh, entomologists that said, well, in Western Europe, these gypsy moths uh, have a predator. We need to bring the predator over here. <laughs> and so uh, you know, they found, I forget what it was, some kind of bird or something that, that would actually eat those things and actually wound up training uh, the other uh, birds here in America that gypsy moths are good to eat. So, uh, but that didn't bring them under control. They still had these 10-year cycles. They're just complete destruction. <coughs> and the problem is, when the forest would come back, it would never come back like it did before. So it was getting, the de degradation was getting worse and worse with each cycle. And so they said, we have to bring a parasite over from uh, Europe. And they did. They brought a parasite of the gypsy moth over. But things did not get into balance until they brought two different parasites <coughs> over from Europe. And finally, things were brought back into balance. So you actually do need uh, parasites. They play a good role. And none of us like parasites when they attack us, uh, but they do play a critical role in the ecosystem. Yeah, Steve. How do we divide uh, between God's I'm going to give a little indicator here. God's perfect will and maybe secondary will. We have <coughs> parasites that give balance.
comes to a smell, but they're the safe and operating, <coughs> and with bad things. Would parasites be God's second choice after the fall, and only as a result of the fall, or would they have been before the fall? They were before the fall. I mean, there's plenty of evidence that parasites existed before the fall. Uh, but how this fits in is that there are passages in the Bible that tell us God began his works of redemption before he created anything. I think this is part of the glory of God. Okay, God's glory is revealed in creation, and in everything he's created is for the purpose of redeeming billions of us human beings unto himself. And so he would know that sin was coming, that rebellion was coming. I mean, it's all part of his plan. He's going to use the sin that Adam introduces to achieve a greater good than would have been achieved if Adam had never sinned in the first place. And parasites are part of that. They play a crucial role, but they were all there. And so the laws of physics are there because of sin and evil, and so are the parasites, so is the carnivorous activity. I think this is the thing our young earth friends are missing, is that they think carnivorous activity is evil, they think parasites are evil, disease and cancer are evil, Hey, all these are tools manifesting God's glory in the context of his creating in order to bring about the redemption of billions of human <coughs> beings. A time will come when there will be no parasites. A time will come when nothing will decay and nothing will die. But not until God's redemptive work is finished. Then that will happen. And I think that's crucial. I mean, I got to share uh, on one of the documentaries uh, that I did with the, the Christian Broadcasting Network, unique to Christianity is two distinct creations. The creation we're now in as a tool in God's hand to eliminate evil and suffering once and for all, while at the same time enhancing free will. To me, that's the great marvel of God's creation, is that he's eliminating evil and suffering once and for all, simultaneously enhancing our free will capability to experience relationships and love. I mean, the easy thing for God to do is make us all robots. That would take care of the problem of evil. He says, no, I've got a higher goal in mind. I want my creatures to experience love. And I want them to experience love, not just linearly, but geometrically. But that requires, the first, the conquest and removal of evil. And all the creation reveals that. So I think we miss the glory of God if we don't put it in the context that all this creation is for the purpose of redemption. And also to put it in the context, God's intent is that his work of redemption would be completed quickly once we human beings show up on the cosmic scene. So when people say, well, why did God take 14 billion years to get everything ready? Because what God's goal is he would complete his work of redemption quickly rather than slowly, which means we only get exposed to the mosquitoes for a brief period of time. Hey, we're only talking a few decades in your life and a few thousand years in the case of human beings. Contrast that with all of eternity in the new creation where no one will ever get bit by a mosquito or horsefly ever again. What's, yeah. the, difference, what's the difference between a gypsy moth and a miller? A gypsy moth and a miller moth? Hey, we used to have a couple of professional biologists in the class. Uh, I'm not sure we do anymore. So I was always able to... Uh, go to uh, uh, Richard Dean to answer questions like that. He could always pop off the answer. I know what a gypsy moth is, but I'm not too care, uh, not too much up on Miller moths. Anybody know anything about Miller moths? Hey, if you don't, get out your smartphone and Google it, right? <laughs> I don't have to be the expert. Google's the expert. Okay, Steve, have another comment? Uh, in talking to young Earth, and, and really many people, but especially young Earth, uh, and the story of redemption, I like a lot. I put in the idea of separation of evil from good to heaven and hell. But young earths seem to not be able to sometimes go past the garden fall. They're so focused there. And if we can focus, and feel free to correct me if you disagree, of course. I look at redemption as far before, and God's knowledge and planning far before that there were a third of the angels that fell, and there was a problem, and he has this universe to take care of that problem. That's the big picture of redemption, and sometimes if we get them focused beyond the garden fall <coughs> to see the big pictures, that helps the framework. Well, you know, God foreknows and he predetermines. Before he created anything, he knew that Satan would fall. 
he knew that Adam would fall. And so doesn't it make sense that he would create knowing that that was going to happen and design the creation with all that in mind? But I think you're making an excellent point. Adam was not the first one to fall. Right. Satan was the first one to fall, and the Bible is silent on exactly when he fell. Now, interestingly, a lot of my younger friends think that Satan fell 10 seconds before Adam did. But I think that's hard to sustain based on what else we read in Scripture. And they say, well, Hugh, how about one day? And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, we really don't know. I mean, it could be billions of years before Adam fell. Uh, we do know from Job 38, verse 7, that the angels were there when God laid down the foundations of the earth. So they've been around a whole lot longer than we have. And it tells us in the Bible that God is basically having the angels watch his work of redemption unfold. If you want to know why in the new creation we'll be elevated above the angels, it's because we experience the grace of God, the angels watch the grace of God. And they're eager, as Paul writes in his uh, books, the angels are intently observing us in order to determine what is this grace. They're trying to figure it out. But we get to experience it. And because we get to experience it, we're going through training and education that the angels are not able to experience. And yet, God says, take this life seriously. I'm training you for a future career. I got to share this with the students at Regents, saying, you know, your whole 80, 90 years of life here on planet Earth, it's analogous to this course you're taking right now. And notice what your professor does in this one semester course. He's actually paid by Regent University to make you suffer throughout this semester. <laughs> Why? Because that professor is trying to equip and train you for a future career. He says God's doing the same thing with us. If you want to know why there's suffering in this life, it's because God is preparing us for a future career. And the thing I've noticed as a professor, my best students want more suffering. They're the ones who want more suffering because they have a very clear view of the career goal. And this is what it tells us. You see it in both Peter's letters and Paul's letters. He says, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then God has called you to suffer more than the non-Christians. Because God's going to use the suffering you go through to bring about his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. Every time you suffer, look for the glory that God's going to bring about. Can any of you think of a passage that draws that out explicitly? Romans? Romans chapter 8? <laughs> okay, now you know the passage. All the things work. All the suffering you go through, God's going to bring about his glory, which teaches me this. When you're going through exceptional suffering, look for the glory of God that's going to come through that suffering. That's Romans 8, 28. That's correct. John, you've had your hand up for a while. Well, I'm just going to mention that sometimes when I try to summarize the, the nature of this whole uh, plan to people, I'll say that our individual lives and all this history of humanity in the past millennia is part of a course called Introduction to Eternity 101. <laughs> Introduction to Eternity 101. Very good. Okay. And uh, then you get to take the advanced courses, right? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, for a long time I used to think uh, that God created black widows because after they made, they eat their husbands. Do <laughs> you think that's a pattern for humans? Well, I hope not. <laughs> so, all you women listening to this uh, <laughs> live streaming, and uh, those of you who are uh, downloading this, so uh, that might work for the, uh, the spiders, but that's not a good analogy for us. Okay. All right, let's see if we've got time to jump into the next text. Hey, by the way, when am I supposed to end the class? We start Four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon? Keep going until you're yeah, out of here. You, you. Okay. We'll, let, we'll let you know. I, I think 12.15 is what yeah, I've been aiming for. Yeah, okay. All right. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have purposed, so will be as I have planned it, so it will happen. Okay, what is this saying? And then how do we apply it? 
kind of like predestination. Okay, that's a good comment. You can trust the fact that God's got everything under control. Everything's planned. Kind of what we've been talking about. God had Adam's fall planned before he created anything. He had Satan's fall planned before he created anything. Yes? You know, the question often comes on free will, how much does God force, manipulate? And it's nice to know that he knows, but doesn't necessarily force all the time. But I do think he forces his cards. Uh, examples in the Bible would be, uh, it's time for the nation of Israel to become a fledgling nation. And it's time to force Pharaoh. Uh, and, and, and to strengthen, and that word harden is better translated strengthen. He strengthens what is already there, evil in Pharaoh's heart. Uh, but there's plenty of room between the envelope for free choice. Just a thought. It is just a thought. And uh, you know, I cover this in briefly in the book Beyond the Cosmos. You'll see a chapter on free will and a chapter on predestination. And Jackie, you can remember we spent a whole year in this class uh, going through those 3,000 passages of the Bible on the free will and predestination and basically making the point human free will is undiminished but also undiminished is God's predetermination seems like a contradiction it's only a contradiction when you try to look at it from a human perspective if we allow God to be as big as what the new physics tells us as he must be and God can simultaneously predetermine every thought we think, every word we speak, every action we perform, and yet give us complete free will over our words, actions, and thoughts. And what I've done in Beyond the Call of is simply show you three ways God can do that if you allow him to move and operate in the equivalent of three independent dimensions of time. And maybe it's nine dimensions of time. Maybe it's dimensions of temporality that got nothing to do with time. But we're realizing we're looking at a God that can create space-time dimensions of will and maybe other dimensions as well. God's got an infinite number of ways of having both simultaneously true. And uh, for those of you who have taken physics classes, there's plenty of things in physics that seem utterly contradictory, but if you actually study them in some depth, you know both are true. famous one is, light is simultaneously waves and particles. Sounds like a contradiction. Once you integrate quantum mechanics uh, with statistical mechanics, no problem. Get a bigger picture, you can see the resolution. And this is actually one of the ways we know the Bible is the Word of God. It's the only holy book of all the religions of humanity that came, contains doctrines that can't be visually resolved in length, width, height, and time. That's why every other religion eliminates the Trinity. Every other religion either goes with free will, human free will, or divine predestination, but not both. You're not going to be able to visualize it in the dimensions we humans can experience. You know what that told me as a young man? This book, the Bible, is different. It contains <coughs> doctrines and teachings that transcend the limits of human visualization. These other books have the fingerprint of being written by mere humans. The Bible has a fingerprint of being a message that comes from a being that transcends the dimensions that we human beings experience and where we can visualize phenomena. So that was kind of the first clue I had that the Bible was different and it really could be uh, the inspired inner word of the God that created everything because it transcended the limits of human visualization. Okay. The Lord of hosts has sworn as I have purposed, so it will be as I have planned it, so it will happen. Application. What does that tell us about the universe in which we live? I mean, think of what you've been taught in your public education. Quite counter to this. This is not mainstream science. What's different here? Pardon me? Okay. Yeah. For me, it, it represents security. The responsibility is the Lord's, not mine, to make things right, to ensure that we go well. Yeah, God's got everything under control. Uh, but, you know, kind of what you see in mainstream science, 
is that the world of nature is filled with random outcomes and accidents. Okay, this is saying the exact quote, opposite. Quote accidents. Yeah. That. Uh, and the contemporary audience was this? I'm trying to remember if this was pre-exile or during the exile. Okay. There were a lot of bad things going on that his audience was was thinking yeah, of. Yeah. This is this is pre-exile. Yeah. The entire book of Isaiah is pre-exile. Was, was growing and and so there were fears of all that. There was fears of an exile coming. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, so, I mean the Assyrians were attacking so at the time of context, Isaiah. I mean, that's a world that we have a hard time even appreciating. Well, I mean, if we were to go through the entire book of Isaiah, God basically, through Isaiah, is communicating, look, things look bad, things look like they're out of control, but this is a God where everything is under control. <coughs> and yeah, uh, Isaiah was a prophesying that an exile would come, but basically saying, that's God's handiwork. And yeah, your sin may have brought this on, and then you've got Jeremiah and Ezekiel making a point. When they're in the exile, you know, this is not the end. You're going to be here a while. So I have, have children, uh, you know, set up industry, uh, establish careers, because you're going to be here a while, <coughs> but also God's going to bring you back. And uh, Jeremiah prophesied you're going to be there for 70 years, so the people knew, hey, God's got it all under control. But likewise, this is saying this is true of all creation. Everything in creation has a purpose. Every outcome and event has a plan, a purpose. Nothing happens by accident. Uh, nothing is a random outcome. Whereas we're taught in mainstream science that mainstream science is filled with things that just happen randomly. And it's true. Statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics, it all looks random. It looks random <laughs> to us. It's not random to God. We are struck with uncertainties and apparently random outcomes. Uh, but you know, God is not constrained by our physics. He knows what's going on in the quantum uncertainty and the statistical mechanics. Okay. Yeah, then you, and then we're going to close off the class. Go ahead. We just went through Ecclesiastes before we started with Isaiah. Yes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, for everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven. It goes on to say in verse 9, what has the worker, what gain has a worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. This is how the Lord said it through Solomon. Yeah. So whenever things don't seem to fit, or seem, seem to be just accidents happening, it's all under God's control. So when a natural disaster happens, it's all under God's control. <coughs> However, it was the same Jesus who said, you know what? Don't build your house on the sand. Natural disasters happen. It's all under God's control, but we can be wise in response to that. Yes? Um, regarding the seemingly chaotic statistical uh, data, uh, when you look at it synergistically, ecologically, the different ecologies and different systems do have start to show the evidence of God's plans uh, as we learn more and more uh, in terms of the whole branch of synergistic ecology. Well, where this is now coming to fore in uh, NASA, and a lot of you here work for NASA, a lot of you are at JPL, is that uh, they're beginning to recognize, hey, trying to put a colony on Mars or on the moon uh, or building an artificial planet, the problem is if you make it too small, you can't take care of all these random outcomes and accidents from our perspective. God made our planet just the right size. So that way, when we make mistakes, things can be balanced out. But if you make the ecosystem too small, you're going to have problems. And remember that little um, place they put in Arizona? Yeah, it was eight acres. And uh, they said, we're going to actually have people live there where everything's going to be nicely in balance. The problem was it was too small. Eight acres was not big enough to be able to avoid. Because what happens is you've got human beings in there who do things that are stupid. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, God put us on a big enough planet when that we would do stupid things, the ecosystem's able to recover. Because <laughs> it's just big enough. But to put us on the moon or on Mars, it's going to be a whole different matter. So is that place just a monument to the stupidity of man now? Nobody's living there? Yeah, no one's living there now. Okay. Yeah. Is this a great big sign that says, oops? 
Well, I mean, the one thing they didn't take into account, they, they had it all planned, you know, we're going to have a balanced ecosystem here where the plants will produce oxygen, the humans will breathe out carbon dioxide, uh, we're going to have a, the recycling of nutrients here, the water is going to be refreshed. What they didn't take into account was the human psychological state. You know, putting, uh, I think they had uh, seven people in there. And, uh, you know, putting seven people in an eight acre place where you can't get out, uh, they found within six months that they were so psychologically unbalanced that they started doing really stupid things, and the whole thing fell apart. And then they started running for office. <laughs> that, that, that may be a good thing to close the class on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that didn't get out on the soundtrack, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we're going to do this for the rest of the text, but I think you got the idea. Hopefully, could go through a little more rapidly next time. But that's the whole thing I want you to remember. What does it say? And what's the application? And maybe next week what I'll do is kind of break up it in the class. Have one side say, what does it say? The other side give the application, and we'll trade it back. How does that sound? Okay, that might make it a little more balanced. Okay. Father in heaven. We thank you for this amazing prophet that you raised up, Isaiah. And Lord, how you use him through his long life, at different times in his life, to be a source of your truth and wisdom, not just to the people of Israel, but to all of humanity. And Lord, we thank you that uh, this book is so relevant today in the 21st century. What it's got to say about creation, what it's got to say about science, how we should apply what we're seeing here, and Lord, how we can counteract uh, some of the naturalistic thinking that's going on in our world today. So Lord, uh, thank you uh, for giving us. And Father, I pray that you would endow us uh, with wisdom, humility, uh, with joy, with enthusiasm, as we go through these passages, as we go through these questions. Lord, that we would be equipped more effectively than ever before to be used by you to bring other people to know you as creator, Lord, and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Two quick reminders. I need a clear floor. So if you're